Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Aaron and Michael for bringing me here and for Dean Abraham for uh, having me and making sure that uh, this went fine. And also for the staff uh, that has put this all together and made sure uh, everything worked. So uh, I want to talk about uh, living a complete life. Um, this is a view that I've thought about for, oh, about 50 years. Uh, it's a view I published about eight years ago. It's highly unpopular, but it's true. <laughs> and I am right. So uh, how do we get this? Um, just think about how uh, uh, aging is portrayed in the media. Uh, and in life in general. Um, these are common pictures you can see uh, of uh, uh, older people uh, with uh, notions that uh, we should uh, try to slow down aging. Here's another view. This um, was actually an advertisement in the New York Times, a picture related to an advertisement in the New York Times. Uh, run uh, just after my unpopular article was published. It says, when the view goes on forever, I feel like I can too. Go long. I want you to just absorb all the messages that they're sending with that. This was also just published uh, about a month after I did Searching for the Fountain of Youth, where some New York Times reporter went to a, 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 a village of uh, 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 older people looking at, uh, in Florida, looking at uh, all the things these 80 and 90 year olds were doing. I want you to look at that very closely as well for the messages they're portraying. Uh, and here, uh, um, the CDC reporting that uh, life expectancy reached an all time high in the US. It's sim subsequently gone down, um, which is also not a good thing. And we'll, I'll talk a little bit about how we should think about life expectancy on average in the population. Um, but these are the messages. And then there's uh, this message, which has been highly touted by lots of people, uh, a very uh, well-renowned uh, um, uh, New York Times columnist, David Brooks, wrote about this graphic, uh, which is something that the Gallup poll uh, regularly measures. Um, and they ask people about their happiness and then correlate it with their age. And you get this nice U-shaped graph um, and it's actually fairly consistent, and you could see uh, this. Uh, the uh, researchers who put it together with Brookings wrote, youth is the happiest time of our lives is overblown. Sorry to all you young people in the audience. <laughs> the middle age years are well, as expected, and then things get better as we age, and we get happier uh, as we age, or so the uh, experts uh, seem to claim. Now. I ask you, again, I want you to think about what the essence of these portraits are of old age, uh, but also what's missing from those portraits of old age. Well, for one thing, this is missing from those portraits of old age. Somehow they never make the New York Times uh, advertisements uh, from the uh, Association of Retired People. Um, uh, and uh, roughly, 55 million Americans are over 65. We have at least a million people in assisted uh, living residences. Nursing homes are 1.3 million. Homebound the elderly are, is a wide range. But if you survey people over 80, you'd be shocked how many never leave the house um, and are literally homebound and uh, uh, don't go out at all. When we think about life and aging, what do we care about? Well, one way to get to the heart of the matter is to ask parents what they hope for their kids. Um, and you often hear this phrase, at least in America, I don't know what, it, what the Israelis respond, but you hear, I want them to be happy. Well, what do you mean you want them to be happy? I want them to have a happy life. Well, um, I don't want to be overly philosophical, but being happy and having a happy life are two different things. They're not the same, right? Being happy is a momentary pleasure. Um, having a happy life is a kind of lifetime thing. You have to go through the whole life to have a happy life. Uh, it's certainly a decades long moment. We can have a happy life and still be unhappy at various moments. I would actually suggest 
that uh, if you want a happy life, you're going to have to suffer, uh, at least for some of that life, um, and it will be unhappy. But you can have a bad life also uh, and have unhappy moments and be happy at various moments in time. So these are very two different things. So it's useful to ask what parents mean when they say they want their children to be happy or to have a happy life. Um, it might be useful to you if you think that what you want is a happy life. Um, and it's worth thinking about what happiness is. I never, I try never to use the word. I try to never use the word. The problem is that since Aristotle, people have been using this word to connote a ideal life, and so we're kind of stuck with it. So there are three ways of thinking about happiness. One is a sort of hedonistic pleasure way. Another is a desire theory, which probably most of you are actually subliminally, if not fully, uh, uh, familiar with. It's actually the source of that U-shaped curve. And then there's what's called the list theory of human capacities. Two of these are subjective, and one is more objective, and I'll explain that. Um, so think about this. Do parents really want their children to be hedonists? to collect a long series of pleasant experiences that make them feel happy over and over again. Again, I don't know if Israelis have this same phrasing. I doubt it, actually. But we call uh, the, such parents helicopter parents. They hover over their kids, and the moment they're stressed, they swoop in to take the stress away. Um, and uh, that's, uh, unfortunately, all too common. Uh, I would suggest this is a terrible way of thinking about it. I think five minutes reflection, five seconds reflection shows why. Um, the wonderful model is the empty lives of the idle rich. Um, we know them too well. Um, we see rich who don't have to work, um, chasing pleasures, um, and uh, they end up having nothing to live for. Maybe you know some of these people. If you don't know them, you've certainly seen them in the media because they're often portrayed as someone who you should envy. Um, there are problems with trying to pursue pleasures, endless pleasures, right? Psychologists call it habituation. Economists call it diminishing marginal returns. And behavioral economists call it hedonic adaptation. They're all the same. The more you try to get pleasure, the less it means, right? Um, all of us understand uh, that you get a pleasant stimuli, you repeat the stimuli, and you get habituated to it. It's actually very well known in all sorts of things. The brain is wired for this. It's true with vision. It's true with all sorts of ways that neuro neurologically we're wired. We get a stimulus over and over. We eat the same wonderful food. It becomes boring to us. We need something new to excite us. <clears throat> We know this from things like lottery winners and non-lottery winners, right? People grossly overestimate the positive impact that acquiring new possessions will have on their lives. Instead, people habituate to the new status quo of having more things, and those things become familiar and no longer give them joy, give them pleasure. This habituation phenomenon is something I think we know very, very well. We've studied it, but we don't actually incorporate it into our thinking about how to live. Because of habituation and diminishing marginal return, people who chase pleasure have to get ever more of it to get the same positive response and joy. And so hedonism is a lot like addictions. Um, and addictions, they work exactly the same way. You get some, you download, down regulate your receptors, you need more to get the same buzz. Um, hedonism is not a recipe for a happy life, but for a boring life and ennui. Um, it is the key to empty lives of the rich. So I take it that hedonism is not what we want. It certainly shouldn't be what we want. So when you talk about desire theories, and this is the normal assessment or the reigning assessment, and it, again, it's behind that U-shaped curve that gets so much attention. The kind of questions that are asked, are you happy, are like these. In most ways, my life is close to an ideal. The conditions of my life are excellent. I'm satisfied with my life. So far, I've gotten to the important things I want in my life. If I could live my life over, I would change almost nothing. 
You can just think about those questions. They're all subjective. They're all an assessment of what I want. You might ask, well, how do you know what you, how do you come to know what you want? I would just say the bottom, if I could live my life over, I would change almost nothing. If that's true for anyone, right? There's something seriously wrong, right? All of us have made terrible mistakes in our life. If we haven't, I don't think we've taken enough risks in the way we've lived. Um, uh, I would just point out um, Benjamin Franklin, one of the greatest geniuses of all time, um, wrote his autobiography. And in his autobiography, he put uh, things next to uh, activity or episodes in his life. He said, errata. Uh, errata is a word of a printer. It means, you know, to fix it. This is a mistake. You got to fix it. And so various points in his life, he identified in his autobiography, erratas, things that he would have changed. He had two big erratas that he thought were real problems. Um, so again, those are the questions that are asked uh, on this to get this kind of scale. By the way, you see men and women are almost identical uh, in this uh, graphic. And so the having of children doesn't seem to ex uh, affect women worse than men, uh, which is the usual account for that uh, drop um, uh, in the U. Um, so I think that there are four, four problems with this kind of view. First of all, if you ask people, they make snap judgments. If I ask you now, you know, are you happy or not? Uh, are things going well for you? It depends on what's just happened to you, the momentary mo uh, situation. Second, we all know that we discount the future. We think it's less good at planning. Um, and life satisfaction is very relative. All of us are subject um, to diminishing aspirations uh, and ambition uh, um, uh, to the idea that uh, uh, if we have lower ambitions and we achieve those ambitions, we're happy. It's, it's often, uh, you can perceive it as the Danish problem. The Danes are the second most happy people in the world. And when you try to figure out why the Danes are the second most happy people in the world, it's always, oh, they have low expectations, right? When they won the World Cup, right, they all went wild because no one expected the Danes to win the World Cup. Um, and it, if you have diminished expectations, you can be happy because you can achieve those expectations. Again, there's this kind of adaptation habituation situation. Um, it turns out that if you ask that question, um, is it vital or do, we, or do I have to interrupt? Yeah, I'm happy to ask it at, now or at the end. It just depends how important it is. And you said that people discount the future. How does this affect the happiness that you said about? What did you say? How is discounting the future affecting the happiness? Oh, because if you're older, right, if you discount the future, right, then you don't have to plan for it. You don't have to, you'll see about striving. It's very important to strive for, uh, in my opinion, for happiness. Uh -oh. Thank you for asking that. Um, th here's the point. One of the things that happens as we age is you young people, right, you have a long time in front of you when you think about striving. You think about what you're going to try to accomplish, the startup you're going to try to have, or the impact on the world you're going to have. Turns out, as we age, um, we don't strive. We don't have that much time to do it, right? So uh, we're satisfied with more limited goals, and more pos smaller positive things make us happier. We focus on the positive, not on striving. So I think that's not a very viable notion, but I'll come back to it. Even if you like it, I'll, I'll show you why I think it, it boils down to what I'm about to say. Now, um, I think a better view is this Aristotelian view or a view of fulfilling your capacities uh, or trying to live a meaningful life. Aristotle thought happiness was the ultimate end of life, but it wasn't a subjective, but it was an objective notion. Uh, happiness. Uh, uh, has the association with pleasure and satisfaction, but he was talking about fulfillment, and he had a very different notion than either hedonistic or these desire fulfillment ideas. Um, and what did he consider fulfilling? Fulfillment 
He, he thought fulfillment of our human capacities was essential, living up to realizing our full potential as human beings. And so you might ask, what are the capacities and full potentials that we have to fulfill and how do we fulfill them? What are the necessary means to the ends? Aristotle had this view that you had to have an examined life, a rational life plan. You had to pursue justice. You had to be temperate, the middle course. You had to be benevolent or generous, kind to people. You had to have friendships. In fact, uh, in his book of ethics, you might think about this, out of 10 books, there are two of them are devoted, 10 chapters, two of them are devoted to friendship. Intellectual curiosity. Um, ben Franklin, who again, I think is an incredible genius, thought a meaningful life was committed to improving the world around you and that the stamp of having a meaningful life was leaving it better than you came in. And Susan Wolf, who's a philosopher at uh, University of North Carolina, suggests um, that a meaningful life is loving things and goals that are worthy of love. So doing what we love, but when people say chase your passions or do what you love, that's inadequate, she argues. And she says, what we love has to be objectively worth it. Uh, others have to recognize what we're doing as worthy. And it's not just subjective. It's not just, are you happy with your life? Is your life going excellently? So it's got this subjective component, we do what we love, but it's also got this objective component, what we love has to be worthwhile. Now these views I think are very similar, if not identical, and I am not gonna spend my time trying to parse them the way a lot of philosophers were. The first thing I would note is passion's not sufficient. It's insufficient for a meaningful life. It's necessary, but insufficient. Fulfilling my ideal or what I consider important or being satisfied with my life is not sufficient because often we can be satisfied with things that are insignificant or worthless. And I want to give you an example that was just in the news. Maybe you saw it, maybe you didn't. Hopefully you didn't because it's really terrible. Um, just within the last month or two months, I forget exactly when, a man set the world record for visiting Disneyland more than anyone else. 3,000 consecutive days, 8.2 years of continuously visiting Disneyland. Right now, the reason it was in the news, this is a Guinness Book World Record. I can't imagine a more worthless, well, I can imagine a more worthless en endeavor, but this pretty much sums it up. It's obviously a moment of passion. You don't do something for 8.2 years without passion and pay all that money, but to what end? So I think that Susan Wolf has something very important here, as does Aristotle, and uh, Franklin, which is what you're doing has to be valuable. It can't just be something that consumes you. And we know lots of people who are consumed by <laughs> trivial or insignificant things like this individual. Um, improving the world, uh, it has to be a genuine improvement. Just having a Guinness Book of World Record of something, the biggest ball of string is not worth doing. All right. So to, I would say that to have a meaningful life, we have to be committed to something beyond ourselves. And that something has to include realizing our capacities, the capacity to be just, to be benevolent, have friends, improve the world. And uh, it has to be worthy, good, and valuable. Um, loving, uh, being committed, uh, I think, to an activity and really having it consume us is linked to the notion of flow. And many of you will know that notion. It's being fully immersed in an activity that is a challenge, but within our stretch capacities. So we lose a sense of time, lose ourselves in trying to pursue it. We're not all virtuous in all ways, but by work, we can all become virtuous and realize these capacities. So I wanna say, Living a meaningful life has four elements of a complete life. One, you need the complete means, having all the necessary inputs to lead a meaningful life. Two, you have to have uh, a complete lifetime. You have to go through all the stages. 
Uh, you have to have a complete life living all the way to the end. You can't judge a life as meaningful or worthy uh, halfway through. And you need complete components, realizing the full range, not just some uh, artificial range. Now, these some of these are very, very controversial, and I'm willing to uh, bear that. Uh, so Aristotle wrote that to lead a meaningful life requires certain goods to exercise our human capacities. They are means, not ends, of a meaningful life. Some may be worthy in themselves, but mostly they're worthy as means to leading a good life. Physical health, mental health, a modicum of wealth, friends, and power, some po power. That modicum of wealth and power, the mainly the modicum of wealth is very hard to leave a meaningful life if you're in abject poverty uh, and power. You need to effectuate what you are doing. If you're constantly frustrated, it's hard to uh, lead a life that is fulfilling. Franklin thought, that a meaningful life required, he didn't say this, but I'm interpolating it from things he did. Intellectual curiosity, sociabilities, so that's the friends of Aristotle, learning from others. He thought it was incredibly important to listen to what others said and doubt your own views, and being able to grow, admit errors and flaws, and constantly being able to improve yourself. Now let's talk about the complete means. Importantly, the means aren't necessarily goods in themselves, as I said. Having more wealth or honor is not an ultimate end. They're goods when they are part of realizing worthy good or projects. Just collecting lots more pieces doesn't make it good, whether, even if those pieces are um, 100 shekel notes. Using wealth, mental health, power, influence for a worthy end is good, but they're not. Uh, using them for bad or just empty ends or goals is not good. So just as an example, obviously using the power of Fox News for more wealth is not a good and can lead, as we've seen, to lying and bad. In a kind of way, they're means, but some of them are also necessary. They're necessary, but not sufficient, as I mentioned. If we lack mental capacity, it's hard to leave, lead a meaningful life that is a very controversial statement, and we can discuss it. Um, it's a, Similarly, I think without the ability to grow, it's hard to lead a meaningful life, and growing requires recognizing mistakes. Um, it's hard to lead a meaningful life, I think, with severe dementia or lack of curiosity. Um, so we could, again, talk about this. It's also, I, I would argue, hard to lead a meaningful life with social isolation. I think there might be some examples um, that where that works, but anyway. Um, so think about, you know, these mental health, physical health, social interactions, having friends, family, colleagues, collaborators, having curiosity, learning from others, and being able to grow, admit mistakes, and having sufficient income to not have to worry about extreme poverty. Um, having these goods is necessary to be able to lead a meaningful life. Of course, there are some people who can lead a meaningful life without some of these. People can have meaningful lives with severe physical disabilities, poverty, no friends. You can think of Helen Keller, blind and deaf, uh, clearly able to lead a meaningful life. So it's possible they tend to be outliers. Uh, it's not possible, I think, for the average of us. This man, Benjamin Lay, was um, uh, uh, four feet, lived in the 1700s, um, was a campaigner against slavery and tried to embarrass people. He refused to wear any clothes that were made with cotton because of slaves' involvement. He embarrassed the Quakers constantly about slavery. He lead, led a meaningful life, even though he lived in abject poverty, lived alone in a tree stump, actually. Um, so it's possible, but it's not for the normal. Um, uh, living over a complete lifetime. Um, I would argue that a life is more likely to realize our human capacities if people can live through all stages, infancy, adolescence, adulthood, middle age, old age. Now, a life truncated by death at young adulthood is harder to conceive of as a meaningful life and harder to fulfill all our human capacities. So a life truncated by death at an early age is widely viewed as a tragedy. That's why people would 
we often, I ask this question all the time, you prioritize organs for the 20 year old, not the 70 year old and not the three year old because we think there's something tragic about that age, not having, having, realize, having some plans, but not being able to realize them. And I think uh, that's what's going on. You, that person hasn't been able to lead a complete life. Um, importantly, as people live through later and later stages, death becomes less and less a tragedy. We often say if someone dies, yes, sad that they died, but it's not a tragedy um, as they live longer. If you're saying that there's something which suggests it, life has been fulfilled and you're not missing major parts. You can come in. Um, I think once people have lived through all stages at old age, death is no longer this tragedy. They've lived a complete lifetime. This does raise an interesting question that the geriatricians are often lit. Um, is old age too broad? When I say old age, should we think about old, old age, oldest old age? Um, even if these things are different, if there's a reason to think that living until oldest old or something, does that added time add meaningfulness to human capacities? I would suggest that current evidence suggests that in most respects, old age may be better conceptualized as a single long-term stage. Um, but it has one important implication. Living to old, old age is not necessary for living a meaningful or fulfilling human life. Ever-increasing lifespans is not necessarily a worthy goal. Getting every person to old, old age, to 90 years old, for example, um, may not be uh, the right goal. Um, but on the other hand, I do think living till old age is vitally important. Aristotle said, again, the human good must be over a complete life. For one swallow does not make a summer, nor does a day. Neither does one day or a short time make someone blessed and happy. My own view, to put it into contemporary terms, should have put soccer there instead of American football, but you get the analogy, right? A game's not over at halftime, right? The win only happens at the end of the game. We've seen all games where the side winning at halftime, having a great life at halftime, ends up losing because of something that happens. Same thing happens often in life. Um, we can be happy for stretches, have a good life, but it can all come crashing down with a major loss, which would not seem to constitute a meaningful or fulfilling life. A bad judgment, a bad decision, the resulting dishonor, the resulting error can prevent a meaningful life. Just think about slave owners like Robert E. Lee deciding to lead the Confederacy and defend slavery instead of defending the Union. Or if you are a Shakespeare fan, think about King Lear and his failure at the end. Uh, or Calvin Coolidge, who was a great governor and then became a horrible president because he was depressed. Um, conversely, there are people who can live a reasonable, but not necessarily an admirable life, and that have it elevated to fully meaningful life when they find a, a worthy objective. Think of Zelensky in Ukraine, right? He was a comedian, not distinguished, suddenly becomes president at a moment, and we all recognize that he has unbelievable skills uh, in ho holding a country together and articulating goals for his fellow men. Um, I would also note Klaus von Stauffenberg. How many people know who he is? No one. Everybody. Someone. Everybody? Okay. If I said it in America, you wouldn't assume. Here's a very good example of someone who was had a maybe even a bad life until he did something heroic and, and wonderful. So a life has to be judged at the end with all stages of life included. Where I put all, I should put all in quotes. It doesn't have to be all, it can be most, um, but it does require going through those stages. Can there be people who live a great life at 20? Yes, but not common. Complete components. I would suggest a meaningful life requires realizing the full range of human capacities. It's possible that people can have a meaningful life without realizing some capacity, such as courage, 
But again, think about all of these, having a rational life path, being just, living temperately, benevolently and, ge and being generous, having friends, having curiosity. These are things that are very important to le leading a complete life, not just a hyper-focused life. Um, and I think most of the people we admire have these elements. So I would suggest that realizing that capacities uh, occur in life and requires four components, work, volunteer and avocational interest, social relations, and play. And I want to argue that if play becomes the dominant component while others decrease, especially work and volunteer activities, I want to suggest to you life ceases to be meaningful. And this may be the most controversial thing. What's the content of all the celebrations of older age that I showed you at the start? That's play. Every one of them is play. There's no suggestion. You don't see these kind of pictures, old people reading books or studying or teaching. You might occasionally, but that's not, it's the fountain of youth. You might ask, what if social relations, especially family relations, become the dominant component? Can life really be meaningful or fulfilling uh, all of human capacities? I think this is a big challenge to uh, my view, and it's very important. As we age, the pursuits of work, avocational interest, social relations, and play um, become harder, um, and we begin to focus more and more of our time on play. We transition away from striving, as I mentioned, from trying to change the world or cure cancer or invent lightning rods or riding motor to riding motorcycles and completing crossword puzzles. We stop working, we stop doing volunteer activities, we often stop pursuing avocational interests, and we prefer play. This chart may be hard to look at, but if you look at what people, when you ask them, give them the most pleasure and the least pleasure are most negative. Top one, intimate relations, sex, top. Socializing, relaxing, praying, meditating, eating, exercising, watching TV, shopping, preparing food on the phone. Um, and then if you look at down, uh, you have uh, taking care of my children is not very high. It's a very interesting item. Um, it's less uh, uh, it, it makes you worried about what people are thinking. Napping comes in higher than taking care of my children. Um, so, and, and, and taking care of my children is only slightly better than commuting. So. <laughs> what? I didn't do that study. Not me. I think that might have been uh, Danny Kahneman's uh, beeping people and asking them what they were doing and how much pleasure they were getting out of it. Um, predictions from a complete life. So um, one of the things I would suggest is the diminishment of physical, mental, and social interactions as we age means that we can pursue fewer worthy activities in work and volunteering and may diminish the meaningfulness of our life and our satisfaction. So as you age, your physical abilities go down, your mental abilities go down, your social interactions go down. The ability, therefore, to actually fulfill other things like work, like volunteering may diminish. Um, but you might say, well, but look at this. People have more life satisfaction. Well, it turns out there is a fundamental problem with this graph and all this theory based upon these, this graph of happiness. And that problem is it's cross-sectional, right? You call people up and you assess what they're doing. Well, I mentioned that, you know, you get a snap judgment. There's a more fundamental problem. Who answers the telephone when you call, right? Not people who are demented, not people who are in a nursing home, right? You exclude all of those people from your survey. The second problem is you tend to get people who are willing to participate in this 
So if you actually don't do cross-sectional studies, you do a time series study to ask the same people over and over and follow them as they age, you find a very different graph. Yes, it's got the same U-shape, but then it turns down and it turns down shockingly at 70. And why does it turn down at 70? Well, those people are beginning to have diminished physical and especially diminished mental capacities. This is a British study where they see sequentially every, I think, four years, they ask people. And what happens? Well, this is what happens. Between 98 and 2006, the percentage of American men at 80 and older with physical limitations actually increased. In other words, we're living longer with more physical disabilities at the same age. So we may be living longer, but we're not living more healthy, interestingly enough. In 2006, more than half of women 80 and older had a physical limitation. And these are the graphs over time, and they're, they're coming in over time. The notion that we're living longer, healthier lives, that uh, 70 is the new 50, not true. It may be true in some social circles, but it's not true overall. And then there's mental disabilities. As we age, all of us have slower mental processing, a decrease in working and long-term memory, and an increase in distractibility. All of these are very common. And this is the uh, graph of the risk of uh, the prevalence of dementia uh, over time. And you can see uh, just after 75, it going up uh, like a hockey stick. Um, so that it's uh, a third of people by 85, 90. And the consequence is a loss, a serious loss of creativity and productivity in doing things. So this is a graph looking over time at the age of contributions. Uh, so any of you who are planning to become productive over your lifetime, uh, you can see that the peak of productivity is around 40. By the way, I don't know what it is in Israel, but in America, that's just about time that professors get tenured. And then it steadily declines. Um, and uh, you see that they don't go past 80. Why don't they go past 80? Not that many faculty or professors or musicians or writers are continuing past 80. Um, this is pretty reliable. It's reliable in all sorts of fields, not just science, literature, poetry, uh, um, uh, social sciences. Um, as a matter of fact, um, it's also uh, pretty true uh, over different periods of time. So what happens as we age? Well, completely lifetime has been reached and people have, when they've lived to old age, a complete life has also been reached as people are at the end, although they can undermine a meaningful life if they become angry, aggressive, demented. It's very easy to change how people perceive you. Um, complete means often ceases to be complete with progressive limitations of physical and mental health, and in some cases, wealth. And as we really age with the death of friends, the loss of social interactions, it's hard to have those complete means. Um, it also becomes less and less complete as our life becomes circumscribed with loss of work, loss of volunteer activities, loss of avocational interest, and increasing focus, I would argue, on play and a few social relations. So each of us has to ask the following question. Is a less than complete life, a life with less than complete means, less ability to pursue work, avocational interest, thus less ability to realize human capacities, meaningful? I leave that to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So um, we uh, have some time for uh, what was it? What is it? Okay. So what we'll do now we're uh, going to hear uh, another chapter from our uh, book project from uh, my uh, very good uh, colleague, uh, Professor Barlan, Michael Barlan, an internal medicine specialist, a prolific bioethicist. 
and he will share his insights um, and broad perspectives on the good life. But first, let's get this. Thank you very much, Professor Manuel. Thank you, everybody, for coming. This lecture is dedicated to the memory of uh, Professor Agassi. He was supposed to be here today. He died at age 94, about a month. 95 and a half, about a month after presenting in a seminar his most recent book. He's an eminent uh, teacher and public activist. Now, in a nutshell, the philosophical point I'm trying to bring here today is this issue. We, uh, the more we talk about old age, the older it is, we have less people around to tell us what it is like. So the aged are the kind of a minority. But there's a difference. We, we are using our, especially in democracy, to have a common talk with minority in them. So we talk about women, they're not minority, but is a group or infants or people of color, etc., etc. in our society, they are minority. But there's something different about the aging. Because if I look at myself, for example, I will not be a baby. I don't think I'll be a woman or be a gay person, but I most likely will be old. And it's true for all of us in this room. Statistically, all those present here stand about 80% of becoming old. Change to the other category. And this change in the future looms large over the way we feel, we think, and perceive the issue. So the younger who plan their own old age, the, our voice counts. What is, why is aging? Why? Because it's us. It's about who we will be. But we are at risk of future discounting, as Professor Manuel said, which means um, we don't factor in the fields like we play soccer and we don't prepare the exam because we don't think much what will happen in our future. So I will keep on smoking. I know it's harmful, but if I think of old age as being in a wheelchair drooling, uh, so what's so good about living long? So this is a way of future discounting. But the age, those that are there and they know what it is and they live the experience, we will see that they depend on earlier planning by society okay? or whatever they did as young and they are especially vulnerable to their own perceptions of aging. And these perceptions are cultural and at the end we'll see they suppress important aspects of aging we have not talked about much. So let's see what I'm talking about. There are two uh, researchers I want to show. Um, we, th there are ways, methods to test age perceptions, what people think about old age, whether we associate it with good things, whatever they might be, or with bad things. And when people ask younger, what the, there is a question, standardized questionnaire, and the researcher just wait out and count the years, and we see that those that have positive perceptions about aging live much longer. The difference is over seven and a half years in the average. And there are good reasons to show that there is a causative relationship. And, the, and, and, and that might be big. one factor is that they, those that have negative perception of aging care less about what we call healthy lifestyle. They save and sacrifice less for the future. Then the second research is on the left, the same uh, team. And during the lockdown, they surveyed people over the telephone with this uh, question. If all the persons are extremely sick with COVID-19, that was the first lockdown, they should stay at home and not go to the hospital? This was the question. And the people were divided into four groups, young and old, and then positive age beliefs and negative age beliefs. So when we go for the young, there was no difference. I mean, age beliefs of the young did not affect. It means these are well-educated Americans. They didn't think their own perceptions should affect the justice or the wisdom done by others who are not there. But the aged, the old people with negative perceptions 
tended heavily to say, stay home. They wouldn't fight for their lives. So the aged are there, but because their perceptions about old age are self-reflecting, they affect their choices even even they are against their pursued interests. And we know that attitudes about aging impact cognitive function too. There's less dementia, those that see things in a positive way for all sorts of reasons. And even when we take people for training, physical training, so we take old people for physical training, you know, they get more fit physically, but those with positive age beliefs, those with a lighter grade, the impact of training is much, much higher. So your perception about your own aging counts a lot. And this is the survival curve. Now, the World Health Organization declared, following all these values of studies, the WHO declared ageism, which are negative perceptions of aging, and consequently uh, negative attitudes towards the age, as a major public health risk, like an epidemic. And we found this risk right in our textbooks. This is Harrison's definition. I mean, Harrison is the textbook every medical student needs to memorize and study uh, for graduation exams, I think in the United States too. Aging is usually defined as a progressive process associated with deterioration in structure, where deterioration is fast. So aging is deterioration, and also Encyclopedia Britannica has this idea of aging as deterioration. Then I was asking myself, because I also uh, I am an internal medicine doctor, and I see this kind of patients in, on wheelchairs, demented, all the time. This is the practice. So I was wondering what old age is. Maybe we don't talk about the same thing. And I was searching, and nowhere in Harrison or in other major textbook, will you find a definition of old age? They, they talk about aging, it's a process, but not when is it, it begins, or who is this mysterious category that are old? Are we talking about over 60, over 70, maybe over 90? So I went back to the research because we learned from research. So I can less about metaphysics now. I can know what we can learn and collected major studies cited in the literature about old age, like those cited before. And on the right, you see the criteria. So some studies, they, they compared 57 year olds versus 32. But usually the aged as a category in research begins around 60. This is the average and I found no scientific explanation for this choice. Why over 60? Also the WH website talks about aging, and ageism, and then it, 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 it communicates principally good things about old people. So the, the data given starts from those above age 60, but they do not explain why not start with 50 or 40 or 80. And there are cultural reasons for it. And um, first, the perception of up and down was highly uh, dominant. It comes from American culture. Uh, there is the book, one of the landmark books about the perception of aging by historian Hackett Fisher that described the four phases in American culture about aging, starting with respect for the old, uh, gemontocracy of the uh, fair settlers, going on to the cult of the youth during the revolution that started in the nation, and later on, especially in late 19th century, coming with industrialism, there is this idea of aging as the stage of retirement. Why people retire at old age? So it, it, it is meaningful in the context of industrial capitalism, of workers working for wages where it all started. And this same, up to this is a cartoon from the New Yorker recently, we still have the same perception of 
going up and then going down. And it's like I read people describing the, you know, climbing the Everest. I don't know if it's a meaningful achievement or like visiting the Disney achievement. But in the short, short season of going to the Everest, there are so many now climbing you, they let you stay only a minute or two and, and, and you know, take a selfie. And then you must start uh, walking down the Everest. So this is uh, the basic model of Fisher. Turner discusses it. So we are talking about prestige. The peak we reach is nothing to do with medicine, is prestige. And maybe the, the, the more or less the time people have received a, a full professorship, for example, or whatever. And when the Social Security Act set retirement at 65 for social reasons or physical reasons, and it was a little after Bismarck chose the age of retirement. So around 60, we think of people as retired. And then we see them as aged. But the choice of retirement, deciding that people should or uh, need to retire for certain social work, especially uh, hard labor, because this most employees at the time uh, did more difficult jobs than being university professors. So this is the age of that. And then we culturally calibrate our physical perceptions of aging to fit the retirement aging. It's something that has to do with a similar cultural movement that has to do with sexuality. And we have the age that we physically mature sexually, but in our society, people start being, becoming socially active a little later than the physical age. So we move, our culture moves the biological uses and similar things happens to aging. We have cultural factors and then we calibrate our perceptions of what happens to us biologically by those cultural factors. And let's go to our great teacher, William Osler, who really lived in the peak of his perception. And when he did his farewell talk in Johns Hopkins, it's not that he really retired. I mean, he moved on to Oxford to take another job. But he had this way to, to what a man is saying morally at 30, rich mentally at 40, right spiritually at 50, or never. So you, you will not achieve more beyond 50. I mean, Rabbi Akiva really made it the last minute when they say that at 40, he went to, to study Torah. And then goes on, he said, a teacher of life. Now he spoke not about a manual laborers, but about university professors like him, presumably, should have three periods, study until 25, investigation until 40. You mark this, Professor Abraham, don't expect our research output about 40 uh, in promotion discussions. This is what also says, a profession until 60, at which age I will have been retired on a double allowance, and that's you are not the others of the university <laughs> manager. So not because it's too difficult for his body to carry out, because he is not productive, he is not updated, he is obtuse or whatever. But, but it's not, it, it doesn't work for us, but he, he saw it fit to move on to Oxford, to start being active in medical education and actually be more active and more productive until his death in 1919. And then I will make, well, these differences are not just are not necessarily product of industrialization and capitalism. But let's go to a similar model comes, you know, from completely different area. This is Petkiavo de Mishnah. This measure gives a list for every age what person is a typically fit for. Okay. So I marked by color. I went to the text in Hebrew when negatives. Begin. So in the literal reading of the Mishnah, only a hundred is a strong negative. Okay? He says, Ben Tishim Lasuach is not clear what it means 90. Is this to be bended or to uh, go out and enjoy the garden? Um, but if we go up Los Bartenura, when we read one of the glosses of the Mishnah from the late Middle Ages, when he explains what it means, the negatives begin at 50. 
So this is before industrialization. And as you see here, you go to the Silesians from another Glossipet Israel that lived during the Industrial Revolution, even though in Eastern Europe, um, the Palestinian skips up to 90. So there are different perceptions and the impact of the idea of retirement and, and employment is probably only part of this. And we see a nefarious effect here that when we look ahead towards aging or old age, we tend to anticipate nihilistic or negative choices. This study was made in 1999 about decisions to withhold life-saving uh, care. So dialysis, ventilator, I will not discuss why dialysis has this bend, but starting already at 40, there is a tendency not to intubate patients. So we cannot say that they are going to be drooling on a wheelchair. But sometimes the pressure, the wrong perception, pulls us earlier than any model would predict. On the other hand, there is this phenomenon that's called the compression of morbidity. That in the past, we really had this kind of bell curve in the 1900s when Osler was talking. We can see that people started dying off and they would die 50, 60, 70. But already in 1980, yeah, we have surveys of face-to-face uh, uh, -face interviews conducted with Americans in 1981, and 70% said they were happy. It was not a telephone call. So more and more people stay relatively stable in terms of their health until the health start declining. And this trend goes on today as well. So the population is larger and we have many people who suffer from stroke, from disabilities, and I do not think that those people on wheelchair are necessarily out of meaningful life. We need to deal with this, to explain this, but the rising absolute number does not stand necessarily for the relative numbers. So, as I said, those, the probability of those already 65 reach, reaching 70 out of 90% and reaching 90 could be 34%. And part of our challenge is to find the social context for people to live meaningful life. This is a picture I happen to take, passing in a museum in Firenze. We see here an old man that had to work as a guard in a museum. He probably most certainly doesn't do it because he wants to fulfill himself. He just needs to ache out some money and we don't know why he's in this financial situation. This is a museum of art. He's creative. You can enlarge this photo. He's negligent in his work maybe, but uh, he did not pay attention when I took photos when he was not permitted to do. So sometimes it's about the proper social integration. Now, I want to conclude here with a few points to the develop all. I haven't spoke about a good bit of time to issue the last one. So, as I say, like sexuality has made human social roles are decoupled from biology. This process is ever developing and much depends on perception, certainly when we talk about aging. Like sexuality, wisdom is about constructing the presence in a long term context. I will, I, I know now, now we, I, you need to talk about sex to make it interesting, and that's part of our ageism issue. But uh, one of the things sex teaches us that I would not say the pleasure, but sometimes your presence, the experience of the moment counts a lot, especially if it's the right context. Human presence is key to wise aging, and human presence is something beyond any particular functioning. And when I see in the hospital world, sometimes people care for their beloved ones who cannot much reciprocate in any uh, uh, 
any significant way, at least in the economical level, but the mutual presence provides much meaning to both lives. Like sexuality, awareness of fragility and awareness of the body is key to wise aging. The aged are more aware. It's not that being sick makes you happier, but confronting adversity is something that Professor Mello spoke about, that aging brings, life brings you, is a depth and dimension that you could not have for appreciating earlier. However, wise aging is more broadly socialized, is more promising in terms of experience and reflection on adversity. I mean, more relative to sexuality. This is not a lecture on sexuality. We think of sexuality as something private and intimate, but aging, the challenge is to incorporate the aged in society, and they can often find magnificent roles. One example I will give you uh, came from a project in Zimbabwe that has hardly any trained physicians. So all the women were basically trained in psychotherapy and were sent out to the villages with excellent successes in terms of public health. A, because the culture, the, the population, defer to old women a lot. And second, all women can learn and, uh, and combine their old life wisdom with some therapeutic skills given. Because democratic planning requires universal participation, our challenge is to employ integration of perspectives to tackle age-related future discounting, that we look at aging in a balanced way, that we enjoy the moment, but also appreciate the joy that we expect to have as old people and to balance self-depreciation that often comes with negative age beliefs. Start negative age beliefs. Try, try to think of the horrible situation that we enhance a future discounting and enhance self-deprecation of the aged. This is, would be a kind of dystopia. And we need to develop awareness of broader social issues, such as, we haven't managed time to touch this even, dynamics of the labor market, the hidden economies, that we acknowledge very little the economies of care. In our society, migrant laborers travel, they get very little pay to care for our old ones, what it means for everybody, for them, for us, for our old people. And gender issues, the poverty among old women is a much serious problem, also abuse of the aged, consumerism and medicalization that Professor Emmanuel also touched in the beginning. If being old is a set of medical problems and we must fight aging with anti-aging medicine, you need anti-COVID measures and similarly you need anti-aging measures, then it's an industry that perpetuates the negative images of aging and the isolation of the aging. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bartlett. So, um, so the plan for today was to have, uh, I would say, three generations on the stage, so to speak. Uh, as you know, the first uh, plan didn't go through. Um, Professor Shlomo Shoham, uh, I, I've known him for, I guess, about 10 years. He's 94. Um, and I consider him to be a very good friend of mine. He was supposed to speak here tonight. Uh, this uh, Saturday, I, I visited him and he was not doing that well. Um, so we uh, sat together and uh, he uh, kind of gave, gave me permission to say a few things on his behalf. Um, so uh, some of you know Professor Shaw is an uh, Israeli prize winner in criminology, uh, did a lot of work with uh, people who are with addiction uh, still doing that to this very day. He was teaching in our faculty of law until very recently. And every week we meet here uh, around a quarter to seven on Wednesday with uh, psychiatrists, uh, psychiatric nurses, judges, and lawyers to discuss psychiatry and law. And so he's been a part of that for about seven years. We're doing it in the uh, faculty of medicine, that's the building. 
And so um, a month ago, I come to visit uh, uh, Professor Sean with a person who just completed her uh, uh, MA, uh, writing about Victor Franke, philosophy, and then telling about her and say, oh, I, I knew him many years ago. We were teaching in Vienna, and he gave me this story about something that happened in, uh, during the Holocaust in a concentration camp. Let's send something to the newspaper. And he uh, immediately tells me to open up my computer, and we're writing a letter to Haaretz about how we connect the story of Victor Franke and what's happening today in Israel. A 94-year-old person teaching me to to act now rather than delay for later. That was um, just an example of an interaction with a person uh, who you may assume would not be that energetic and innovative, but it's just an assumption, I would assume. So when we talk about old age, and we talk about it a lot, and he's saying, look, I feel like I have not exhausted life. I, 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 there's like stuff to do. And he has these ideas that would extend for the next few years. Like, let's write a book about this and that. I'm not saying I'm going with all the ideas he's having, but the idea is that he's still hungry for, for things, not just food. And, 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 and that's one element, but it's just one element. And listening to you, uh, Zeke, I think there, there are other elements. Talking about the loss of physical ability, being afraid of not being able to, to walk anymore. And right now, he is struggling with walking, and that's bothering him quite a lot. He's, he's giving me permission to, to tell you that. And, and because he said, look, if, if I'm uh, not able to do things on my own, maybe I shouldn't be here anymore, right? This, this is a serious discussion. When we talk about hope, and he's talking about hope being something a bit dangerous sometimes, but also something important. And so I asked him, does anything bring joy when you're suffering or when you're feeling bad? I said, well, yeah, people still feel that they can get something out of me. They can still come and ask for advice and get some consultations from me. And so we focus on that, on the thousands of students that he had. Um, and the thing is, it's not I'm only there for, for Shlomo, it's like he's there for me. It's, it's I'm, you know, I'm getting a glimpse of what might be the future for, for me or whatever, maybe, I don't know. And I think a, a part of what is important in my view, it's not philosophically that sound maybe, but the intergenerational interaction is, is very important. So the people coming to visit on Friday, on Saturday, the parliament that they have discussing things with their former professor, all these are, I think, the part of what makes Shlomo tick, right? And his, uh, and, and I'll just want to say one more thing. So we talked about hope, we talked about guilt, and um, you know, like people who may have died and so on. And I, I tried to discuss with him whether or not sometimes we confuse being sad for something with feeling guilty about it. And I, you know, so these are the kind of discussions that we're having. And I feel like it is as important for him in 94 as it is for me a few you know, uh, centuries uh, younger. And, and, and so that's uh, just what I wanted to share uh, with you. And, 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 and just one more thing. So he said, you know, it's strange that I, I have you as a friend, as a really good friend, by the end of my life. And it's a bit, it's a bit hard to hear somebody defining themselves at this stage, the end of their lives, but I mean, obviously, you know, the, yeah, it's, it makes sense. And, and and I told him, look, just one more thing. So you're doing a lot of work with people who are addicts. There's this concept of one day at a time. And so, like, I, maybe it's a good concept, right? I mean, you woke up this day. Yes, your legs are betraying you, but but you're here. You're very much here. So yes, I, I am here. And so it's 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 in a way this discussion about whether or not this day is worth, you know, surviving here. And he said, yeah, you know what? I wake up, I can breathe, I can I can talk, I can think. It's a good day. Um, so that's our uh, Saturday morning uh, discussion. And so uh, Shlomo wished he could have uh, talked to you about these things and give you a lot of philosophical um, ideas that connect to his everyday life. But today he's not uh, one of his best days. So on his behalf, I just want to share some of these uh, 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 things with you. And um, I want to say that I'm gratitude. I'm, I'm full of gratitude to him for this weekly opportunity to to learn from one of our great uh, people in this country. And uh, uh, as my mom says, uh, you may want to focus on having some younger friends as well. Um, <laughs> but I think it's 
you, you, you know, those two can go hand in hand. I don't think there's like a, any problem there. So, yeah, so um, we have time for questions. Actually, you have um, a question or one comment and one question. <laughs> That's for Emmanuel. So, I think that from what I saw in your presentation during your talk is that you use happiness and meaningfulness interchangeably. Whereas I'm not sure that even if I hold an objective, uh, approach to uh, happiness, I would uh, see them similarly. So one, one comment. And the other one relates to your question where you ended the presentation. And I, I, I did some work on an assisted suicide having done in, in the past years. And, I, and I, I've been aware of, of the recent polls, especially in the Netherlands and Belgium about extending the criteria for uh, adding time to people who are old and just heading up. So why should they uh, quote, go through all of the stages of their life and just, you know, seize at one point where they're happy? Um, I'm just following this, uh, uh, your question. Well, first of all, I, I mean, um, as I said in, in the talk, I don't like to use the term happy because I think we too frequently associate it with uh, a sort of hedonistic or a well-being notion of whatever I feel. Um, and I think you really do need to have some objective criteria for what is a, a worthy life. And so my objective, I, I think uh, a worthy life is, I was not trying to conflate them. I said, I think behind Aristotle's notion is a notion of a meaningful life. And I think that's a much better notion um, than a happy life, because again, the happy has a, this sort of subjectivist connotation which I reject. Once I think you get to objective, people have to recognize it as a worthy life. I do think you get into something like, uh, not something like, my what, what I think Susan Wolf did a very good job of defining is, something you're passionate about, but it has independent objective worthiness in the world. And people will recognize that it's worthy because there are lots of things we do that are not worthy. They're just not admirable. Um, they may be fine. You know, play is fine. Uh, not alone, but it can't, combined with other things. We can't only pursue these other things. Um, I, you know, I... Um, I Long-standing, been against uh, euthanasia-assisted suicide, the legalization of that. I, I find it wrong, and I think exactly what's happening in the Netherlands and, and, and Belgium, and also, by the way, in Canada, um, is exactly what you would have predicted, what was predicted about the slippery slope. You do it for a defined group, and suddenly we just keep moving who, who it's fine for, whether it's children, whether it's psychiatric patients, whether it's people of old age. Uh, I just don't, uh, uh, and there are lots of other things that I think uh, abuses and problems that go on with it. Um, it's a whole different kind of discussion um, with a lot of other different data that need to be brought in. Well. Well, Yaakov Avino, in the Bible, he tells uh, at the end, Me'at Peraim ayu shnei yemei chayayim, life, uh, bad, and short. Well, he was about hundred, so. But, um, and then you say, this is a patriarch Yaakov, it's certainly meaningful, you started of the nation, you are part of the tribe. But I think the point here, that life could be meaningful, but to make it happy, you need some element of luck that is beyond our control. And certain adversity in his eyes could have been avoided. And overall, you can think that part of your suffering or frustration was a gratuitous, and you don't feel that much happy, but still your life is meaningful. And the same we see today. The invitation to marry, and two months later, uh, the wife had cancer, and for years was struggling with cancer, and then moved with stenosis, and then cancer, and she died. So he would not say that he had the life of joy, but the men were quite content with the life he had. So for happiness, it is maybe something more that has to do much with luck. Some is our responsibility. Okay.
Yeah. You mentioned courage in old age, I assume. Can you expound? Well, uh, I didn't mention courage. That's actually an Aristotelian notion of uh, that that you need. He he thought it was one of the main human capacities: courage, not foolish uh, aggressiveness, and not uh, being a coward, but having the right temperament to get involved when uh, you needed uh, to get involved, and not, for example, acting on an emergency situation or not answering the call when necessary. So in old age, I, in old age what would courage look like? Or? Oh, I, I think it's a it's a virtue the whole of life, um, not just a virtue in old age. Um, so I, I think, you know, being involved when called upon uh, or when the moment presents is uh, very important. That's the way I understand it. Can, can I be courageous for a moment here? Mm -hmm. um, Please. Thank you, Professor Baliglan, for mentioning my uncle, Yosef Agassi. I just two hours or three hours ago, I heard about this uh, gathering. I came from Jerusalem. And I want to be at the end of this thing. I hope it's okay if I stand up and sing a song that I sang in one of his uh, <laughs> places here. Is that okay? Later on at the end? I'm all. In the last Corona crisis, so many old people were afraid of catching the disease or getting sick. And they did a tremendous thing in caring for others, in helping others, in trying to assist in the community. I have seen it with my own eyes. There's certainly much to talk about courage in old age, maybe more than the young. It's not just this, it's maybe on the motorcycle. I do not have the courage to do this. <laughs> because taking this and going for the adrenaline is not necessarily courage. Yeah, well, you don't. Typically, develop virtues. Uh, um, you you might improve them, but that's typically a virtue that you have. These are typically virtues you have all along, uh, cultivated and improved. No more questions. Everything's crystal clear. Thank you for I would like to ask. I got in a way an impression that. Being happy is more dependent on the way a society looks at you. Because you say, okay, invest in things that are meaningful, but are objectively meaningful. Yeah. And somehow I think that being happy is, by the way, not a virtue that I possess, but being happy is about loving life, and sometimes it's uh, in your DNA. It's not something that you can get because you do things that you love, or you do stuff that people appreciate, or that people come and get you advice. Well, uh, okay, so <laughs> there's a lot in there. L let me just say there is clearly when we're talking about subjective happiness, there's clearly a biological component to it. Because if you look at lots of people, we can go up and down, but we always come back to the same, roughly the same place. You look at lottery winners, they come back to the same place. So no doubt on the subjective well-being scale, if you ask people those kind of questions that I put up, there is a biological component. Undoubtedly true. We're wired one way, which is why people who, for example, have accidents and get paralyzed or people who go on dialysis, it's typically six months, they're very uh, uh, depressed and sad situational depressions, but then they come back to a, a level which predated and sometimes is a little higher actually because the comparison level goes up. So there's no doubt on the happiness scale as a subjective measure, you're 100% right. And then you put in a bunch of other things that you said about a meaningful life. I do think um, it's very hard to do something and to independently judge it to be worthy without a, you being in a community where the community affirms that activity as worthy. And I do think there's an important way in which 
That is absolutely critical to having a meaningful life. We don't ab initio get our view of meaningfulness and what's worthy. We get it from the community we're in. And that is very, very, I think it's very important to living a fulfilling life. Um, so that's why I think it's a social phenomenon and socially important. One thing I would disagree with you is I, I, first of all, I don't agree with ageism. I think ageism is not analogous to racism. Uh, um, and it's not, uh, uh, it is the case. It just is the case that the aging process on average has these deteriorations. That's just, you have more physical limitations, you have more mental limitations, you have more circumscribed social interactions. That's just, can you find exceptions to that? Absolutely. We've already mentioned one exception. You dedicated your speech to another exception. All of us have experiences with it. Those are exceptions. The data are overwhelming that these deteriorations are physical, the body begins to fall apart, mental plasticity declines, mental acuity declines. No, in many, many ways you measure. One of the few you don't is uh, your uh, word abilities actually goes up uh, with aging, but almost everything else declines with aging. And so this idea that somehow this is just a prejudice like racism is totally wrong. There's a factual basis that it actually has more limitations than other periods in life. And that the curves I show of, you know, more physical limitations as time progresses, as the decades progress. You're right. In the 80s, there was this belief, oh, we're just going to what's called rectangularize and decrease morbidity. And we're all going to live, 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 and then just fall off a cliff. And it turns out 40 years on from those predictions. That's not true. Now, they still may believe it in California, but that's California. Yeah. I'm talking about reality. <laughs> Thank you. What you mentioned, you can call temperament. It's a strong biological component to it. There are people who are grumpy, maybe I have been more. I was a grumpy person. Being happy has nothing to do with the temperament. It is about judgment that you identify with. You are happy if you judge your life to be good, and you can still be happy. And there's a thing that I is happy with a deflated balloon that he can put in the empty honey jar that he got himself. So it's about judgment, and it's it's a little different. It's true that when we look to society, Aristotle said we need to look at the right society. But if you go to these places of the time and that Professor Emmanuel mentioned, if you live in that society, it will influence you. I'd like to go to this many times, even as you age. Now, I did not have the ages in the book. I started that with show. Some of my talk actually criticism of this talk because we are not talking about a distinct group in society. And many things are behind this talk. Sometimes it's issues of poverty, sometimes issues of class, sometimes issues of our own uh, perceptions or our own ways of justifying a reckless expenditure today because it's fine to discount what we in the future. It's a complex talk. It's not that I presented the ageism uh, talk. Raise your, raise your voice, please. Yeah. I have a question about the increase uh, in use of antidepressants in relation to the concept of happiness. You're not going to answer. You've got the mic. <laughs> there's something there's something wrong look um this goes to a deeper problem of uh medicalization of lots of moods first of all and then uh the notion of uh taking medications to solve every uh problem um as i said in my speech i think one of the most important things in life is actually a little bit of suffering not uh, it really, I'll just say that 
No. When I sent my daughters off to college, I said that the most important thing that'll happen to you at college will be you'll suffer. <laughs> and, you know, first of all, sound cruel. Um, but, uh, and then my eldest went to college. First year was great. Second year was great. Told me I was full of it. Um, and I didn't know what I was talking about. And then the third year, the existential crisis of what am I going to do with my life happened <laughs> and suffering. And it was suffering. And I think it was incredible that it's that kind of suffering, which is incredibly important to figure out what is worthy of pursuit and what is necessary. That should not be medicated. Part of the helicopter notion that everyone should be happy all the time, I think, ends up with things, many things getting medicated. It also is true, and now I might sound like I'm contradicting myself, one of our problems, certainly since 2007 and the invention of the iPhone, I see them using it up there. Uh, well, um, this is like my students. Um, that's prohibited during class. Um, is the decline in our ability to have human to human interaction. We have virtual friends, but human to human interactions have gone way down. The rate of loneliness has gone way up and the, the loneliness, depression, loneliness phenomena is very, very uh, terrible. Um, it's a very bad self-reinforcing cycle. So one of the problems I think we have today, which may lead to a lot of medication is we have an increasing amount of loneliness because we have a decreasing amount of social interaction and a decreasing amount of ability to talk to other people. One of the consequences, I don't know if it's true in Israel, we have a proliferation in America of books on how to hold a conversation, how to discuss with other people. It's like, just talk. I mean, um, and one of the, I mean, I, I noticed this as a, a mentor to people who are, you know, doing research with me. And I said, why don't you call this person and talk to them? Well, I don't call people. What do you mean you don't call people? You know, and this is, I think, very, very common, much more common today than it was when I certainly was uh, growing up. And I think it does lead to this very negative reinforcing cycle. And the response, rather than dealing with the loneliness and the depression that results, the response is, oh, you know, we've got a medication for that. Thank you. We, in history, human society, use of psychiatric substances is life. Today, we vilify alcohol, certainly in America, and for some good reasons. But for some people, we find it better to go have a drink with friends than to take antidepressants, which are personally very, very prescribed. But it's a much broader uh, issue how to cope with suffering. Thanks to use LSD with patients with terminal cancer pain in the 1960s. Now we are becoming back. That was also the cult. Now, cannabis is uh, the new uh, cult, in my opinion, of course, uh, ways to manipulate the mind. It's a very complex issue here. But we cannot win ourselves from the addiction to search something to get addicted to and, and, and get better with. But what we learn from alcohol, even from the smoking and the hookah, and that if you do it, study, you do it in, with a group in a cafe. <laughs> there might be a long term health consequences, unfortunately. But to take antidepressant pill and stay at home the way you describe is not likely to help you. It's one more drug you better be demeditated because we do not count the average number of pills people of the 70s and 80s. Are prescribed to take evidence based um, for the health. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit about how we can increase equitable access to a meaningful life for older people? Like, one of the things I've heard of is people putting elderly people with uh, children in daycare so that they can, you know, all reap the benefits of the aging process. Um, it's a really good question. So I think you have to ask what would qualify in uh, as we age uh, for a meaningful life. And as I said, I think I think you have to have uh, some work, a vocational interest, um, 
uh, social bits, uh, social interaction, and uh, some play. Um, and, you know, it, I do think the idea of taking older people and putting them in classrooms, first of all, there's a limited number who, for whom that will work. It's age limited because of the graph on uh, uh, both physical, but also especially mental capacities where that will work. And for some people, that will be a, uh, a way to retain meaningfulness. Organizing it on a, in a way that can be scaled is very difficult. And I think lots of people have tried uh, over time, uh, but I think it's extremely difficult. And it's one of those things where one of the problems is the longevity of how long older people are going to do that. And there's a lot of reasons why they cut back. Um, uh, makes it, well, is it worth going through the whole effort of screening them, training them, et cetera, for a very limited uh, uh, time? period. And I think that turns out, look, I mean, one of the problems is if you look around and do a lot of surveys, it, it just not that many people after 75 do those things and want to do those things and have the capacity, mental, physical, energy capacity to do that. And, you know, you see this quite regularly. There are some people who can go on and on. They can just go on, it looks like forever, right? Although 90s is pretty, pretty brutal. Um, children to be able to close to all and understand that this is part of life will make them adults that will think about getting old in a different way and maybe plan for it or I don't know. Well, let me raise a few things about that. Uh, yes, that would be a valuable element of rather than focus on the old people, focus on the young people. But it's still the question of whether the oomph gets you what you want. That's the first thing. And the second uh, uh, thing is, you know, many, I don't know about in this room, many people did grow up in three generation households. I don't know that it really changed the way they view it because they subsequently came be adults and they're adults now and it's hard to think that it changed their view that much i think that professor manuel did this before uh, personally if we are doing something artificially for therapeutic purposes taking adults and children it is not likely to last but when the old people or any person has real responsibility and role that will last i Ask every patient, what do you do? And many, many old people tell me nothing. I'm retired. And I say, what is nothing? You wake up in the morning. I want to know what do you do? And then sometimes you learn. I cook for my grandchildren. I went to the garden. I study. And you realize that many, many people have very rich lives that are full of challenges and responsibilities. So why do you answer nothing? Why a woman coming from the Haredi or Arab sector that is a homemaker with eight children tells me, I don't work. What do you do? I don't work. What do you mean, I don't work? She went to the she doesn't start working. So when a whole, you go to sociology, a whole is something, it's about social expectation regarding a person and also self expectation and okay. my goal here is to talk as a professor so you know what it is to see here i talk and, I, and it's about developing the appropriate roles and there are plenty of for many 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 people who are out there because they are retired they do nothing I wanted to ask about your paper in uh, the Atlantic and years ago, if you have anything uh, to add on that, because um, it did steer a lot of uh, debate. Um, have you changed any of the notions that you wrote there? Or could you give a brief description of what it was and why it steered a lot of debate? The article is Why I Want to Die in 75. That's the title. Um, th those of you who, who, who know anything about magazines will know that writers never pick their titles. Editors pick their titles. Writers have the goal of having the title accurately reflect what they're going to say. Editors have the, the goal of having the title 
generate interest. And it might not reflect at all what the article says. So it was not, the article was not about why I want to die at 75. The article was about why at 75, I will stop taking life prolonging treatments. I will not get cancer chemotherapy if I get cancer. I will not have a major life-saving surgery if that's uh, necessary. On the other hand, if I were uh, broke my hip, I would get medical care. Uh, if if uh, I was having uh, uh, some other problem which could readily be fixed, but wasn't about prolonging my life, prolonging my function, uh, I would get that. So it's commonly misunderstood. And the justification was much of what I said. You know, the, the function's going to go down after 75. There are some people who are outliers. And again, we all know one or two, although how true it is, I, 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 um, uh, I, I often question. But I don't, you know, I, I fear two things. One is dependence on others. I don't want to be dependent on others. I don't want to be a burden on someone else. I don't want to pay someone to take care of me. It seems to me they have other things to do with their life that would be meaningful. Um, and I also fear losing my mental capacities. Um, and uh, I, I not being able to uh, do things effectively is not a life I want to live. And I don't want to to leave others thinking about that. And that's why, given all the data, assuming I'm average, and we all have to assume we're average, maybe we'll be outliers, but you can't assume you're going to be an outlier in the top 1%. 75 is about the limit. And I gave you some graphs about why that, again, it's a biological phenomenon. It's not a, uh, it's not something I made up in my head. Your creativity goes down. Your uh, dementia risk goes way up. Your physical limitations go way up. Not a kind of way I want to live. I'm eight years older from when I published that, and I haven't changed one iota. So. I want to relate to what you just said now, if you don't mind. I work with very old people, very old, 90s and above, and I'm amazed how much they still want to live. And you're right, they're deprived cognitively, physically, in so many ways. They'll get amputation in order to stay alive. They'll have major surgery before fourth and turn. They come back and no, they still want to live. I think that it's a very independent and because you said about a meaningful life, I think that a meaningful life is something very subjective. Or rather, the happy life is subjective. Meaningful life may be interpreted And different people find meaning in different things. Now, also, you, I agree with you. Those ones on the scooters and that, I don't know. Maybe I know two of those. <laughs> but other than that, mostly they can't even be bothered to go on like a field trip. <laughs> so just let's say where we are. But I think that this is a if you don't mind my saying so, because everything is true. We're going to get old, and our bodies are going to fail, and our minds are going to go slowly, and faster, and slower. But does that mean we're less worth as a person because we no longer can do things? Or no, I don't think so. I think even a person who all they can do is smile because they don't know who you are even though they've known you for 15 years. But they're like, well, you know, well, I, I, I'm charging a lot of things. So first of all, um, as I said, as the question, the last question in my talk uh, pointed out, right? I just told you my philosophy. It might not be your philosophy first. It might not be your patient's philosophy, okay? They can have a different philosophy. Second, um, I would uh, uh, point out, I don't accept your subjective view of a meaningful life. <laughs> I don't accept that. And the slide between meaningful and they're happy is exactly what I want to prevent. That's not what I think is just because someone says they're happy doesn't necessarily mean it's a meaningful life. And it's and I've given you a view of meaningful that I take to be accepted. I think 
in response to my article, if I took a rough poll, about a third of the people fit into the category you said that have responded to me. And it's not a poll, but it is some effort to write me and criticize me or affirm what I say. About a third of people are in this. I want to live as long as possible. About a third of people are, you know, I don't want to think about this question. I think this is like a crazy kind of question. You're making me uncomfortable because you're forcing me to think about what would make me fulfilled. They're usually bankers and venture capitalists and people out making money. And they don't want to be challenged. Well, why are you making money? What's the good in the making of the money? What's the meaning in the making of the money? The bankers is a little bit of a joke, obviously. And then there are a third of people who agree with me. Let me just tell you a story. I have a very close friend who was um, a government official, ran Medicare in the United States in the late 70s, the youngest person ever to do it. Brilliant. He predicted, by the way, Facebook and Google being able to use masses of data and predict how people would be living in 78. Um, went on to make a lot of money, billions of dollars running, uh, uh, saving a health insurance company and making it uh, a functional. And he thought when I wrote my article, I was full of shit. I was just crazy. About a year and a half ago, he got pancreatic cancer. He took chemotherapy, 11 rounds of chemotherapy, didn't affect him at all, continued to live his life, fly around. He actually came to my house I didn't even know, right? And then he got a Whipple procedure. I don't know. We have any surgeons in the room? Major surgery. Yeah, major surgery. Rearrange everything in your abdomen. You take out the pancreas, you take out the small intestine, you rearrange everything. And then he writes me, three months after four months after that he wants to talk to me his life is terrible he's debilitated he can't go 50 feet from a bathroom because of the surgery why why does he I, he, he said my i thought your article was crazy now i understand the purpose of your article um and he's 77 so um and when we talk i said is there anything that's giving you any positive purpose in your life? He came up with one thing. He has created a program at universities to send people into public service. And he thinks it's fantastic. He loves dealing with it. I don't know that it's going to keep him for very much longer, but it did keep him for at least a couple of more months. But it's an objective worthy goal. He's actually producing students who are going into government service because uh, it's their belief. Um, but I think a lot of people, you know, well, some people are like the patients you described, but there are a lot of people, at least a third of the people who write me, don't hold that view and don't agree with that view. I agree. It is subjective. But I ask you, what is the worthy thing they're doing? What is the thing that contributed? For me, that's very important. If you can't answer that question, it's not a life I want to live. Some people might want to live that. I think the more people think about it, the less likely you want to live with that. And we do think, in general, we make an evaluation. Well, if you get severe Alzheimer's, that's a tragedy. We don't think it's a good. We don't think it's a way to live. And I'm not just talking about myself, right? And I say the same thing. When you get older, someone dies, it's sad, very sad, right? My father died at 92. It was very sad. I was heartbroken. But it wasn't a tragedy. He lived a good life, period. And we know it's going to all come to an end. No one here is immortal. <laughs> one of the key challenges of bioethics of that, that we have people who fight to die and go to Switzerland and we don't fully understand why and then we see patients that are 90 something and demented and suffer so much and they fight or they do not quite live and things do not match so we could easily say well 
know that one is there. The ego, the your philosophy, the ego, the your philosophy. But what I was trying to say in my talk that we need to integrate perspectives because we need to affirm our choices and we need it to be affirmed as part of society of shared cultural values. So the integration is important here. The joy of the youth is important. The life of Claudel Hoping. There is joy in it that I do not believe it. But also the life of those very old patients of mine that I sometimes do not understand what they really want. And some people are lucky to find Professor Agassi that I mentioned, he died of pancreatic cancer. I visited him on the eve of his lethal procedure. Luckily, he had a very competent and courageous surgeon that took him to the procedure, but then he realized it was too much. He still did all that did not perform it. So he lived for a few more weeks, two months, I think, but it was most of them good life. He presented seminars afterwards. So sometimes we need this element of luck. We are here, uh, you wanted to say. Thank <music> you.